dick out your mouth, pussy. Only feel alive when I taste dick. What up, gang? This Ken Zark, Ken Zelig, Zika Milligan, the villain filler trilogy, and we are back on Umineko no Naku Koro Ni. We saw, um. Hey, yo, shut your ass up, bro. Last time, they were, uh, the parents were arguing and shit. And they talked about, like, a treasure or whatever. So, that's about where we left off. So, let's see what's popping off this time. So, on the 10th twilight, the journey ends and you reach the golden land. You really are diligent, Maria. Hold on. You did a good job writing this all down. I forget a lot, so I always write things down. Mama told me to. There was a notebook inside the handbag Maria was always carrying around. And Beatrice's epitaph was copied onto it. Thanks to that, we were all able to challenge the puzzle of the epitaph while walking down this beach. Jessica and the rest had already tried to solve it several times. And had already gotten bored with it. However, since this was a first for me, I was so excited that I couldn't stop. It really tickled my sense of adventure. Let's start with the first line. Behold, the sweet fish river running through my beloved hometown. Where was grandfather's hometown again? I heard that before the war, Oshiro Mia family had a mansion near Odawara. Which makes you want to go, which makes you want to know which sweet fish river runs through, flows through Odawara, right? Yeah, because that river will be the starting place. Anyone searching for the golden land would head down that would head down that and search for the key. What's the what's this river in Odawara? Does it have sweet fish swimming in it? If you're looking for sweet fish in Odawara, it'd have to be Hayakawa. It's famous for its mountain stream fishing. That is not his voice. I hate fish! Maria, I'll, you fuck you. Like, what? You hate fish? Terrible fucking opinion. You disgust me. How do you hate fish? Maria, you'll understand when you get a bit older. Lick, 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 lick. Salty, roasted, sweet fish. Yummy. Even though we just ate, I'm already hungry again. Damn. Um, shall I bring you a biscuit? Huh? Oh, sorry. That's not what I meant. Don't worry. Shannon was faithfully keeping us company since she didn't have any afternoon chores for a while. I would have thought that since she's a servant, accompanying us would force her to take care of us and tire her out. But that didn't seem to be the case for her. On the contrary, she seemed to enjoy joining in on a conversation with people close to her age. When I asked, I heard she was the sort of worker whose room and board were supplied by her employer. So normally the only people close to her in age was Jessica. Yeah, I can imagine that that might be pretty dull. Okay. So I get that sweet fish filled river near Odawara is Hayakawa. In that case, we've got to go down it. Do you find anything if you head down Hayakawa River? Um, if you follow it downstream, you'll arrive at the ocean. Damn. Of course, you... Of course, you'll reach the mouth of the river. And the third line of the epitaph was, as you travel down it, you will see a village. By the way, since long ago, the mouths of rivers have been a key point in transportation, and large cities tend to be built there. That'd be the next checkpoint. Hmm, that's a pretty good theory. Just like you guess, there's an old city there that was very prosperous in ancient times. That's where Odawara Castle is. Ah, uh, I think I might have gone to Odawara Castle on a field trip once. It was really a wonderful castle. Yeah, I also went there. Even though I live in a western style house, it's true that Japanese people feel calmer with the Japanese layout. Castles are boring! Theme parks are better! I agree. I see, I see, okay. If we find the gold, the great battler will generously reserve a whole theme park for a day and let you play in it. Still, Odawara Castle, huh? 
The hidden gold of Odawara Castle. Oh, it's actually starting to sound pretty good. Well, we figured out that much two years ago. The village down the river where sweet fish swim in Odawara. Figured it was probably somewhere near Odawara Castle. The problem is the next line. Okay, let's see where Battler's strange reasoning can take him. Jessica grinned broadly. She seemed to be implying that she would have solved the puzzle long ago if it was that easy. Fuck you. I'm definitely fighting to keep it all for myself. The fourth line. In that village, look for the shore the two will tell, of, tell you of. Look for the shore the two will tell you of. I don't know what it means by the two, but anyway, the shore. What does it mean by the shore? No way. Hmm. Is there any place near there with a shore or Kishi in his name? Um, I've heard about, uh, there's a place called Soga Kishi in Odawara. Huh? Wow. You sure know a lot about it. What could that mean? Shanan, are you trying to solve the riddle and get the gold too? That makes us rivals. It's not like I'm interested in gold. Don't fucking lie. Everybody interested in gold. It's just that George told me about it before. That's because we've reached the same conclusion two years ago. We even went to the trouble of laying out a map and looking it up. See, now, this is where y'all fucking stupid, though. Because why are you so damn confident that you can figure it out without actually going to the damn place? Maybe if you went to Odawara Castle, you see the two they speak of, and they take you to the shore or the Kishi motherfucker. See, that, that, that's where y'all is like about stupid as hell. It was about five kilometers to the north of Odawara. We definitely found the, pl found the place called Soga Kishi there. However, after that, we get stuck. The fifth line doesn't say where the key is hidden in that place. Maria, could you read it for us? No! There sleeps the key to the golden land. I could read it! Soga Kishi is probably large, and there wasn't ever any house built there by the Ushiramiya family. Not much we can do to not much we can do to find a key in such a vast area without any hints. You're right. And without the key, we can't advance to the next line. George, what kind of place is Soga Kishi? Let's see. I've never been there, so I don't really know. But according to this map, it's in the mountains. I'm pretty sure it was at the base of Mount Asama. Hmm. Something doesn't feel right. You'd expect a riddle pointing the way of hidden gold to be a bit more exact. I get the feeling that even the part about Soga Kishi was a mistake. Well, I think it could be Soga Kishi. It could be talking about some house that grandfather lived in when he was a kid that we don't know about. After all, the first line mentioned his beloved hometown. Shanon, you served grandfather's alcohol and stuff lots of times, right? Has he never talked to you about his past? The master almost never speaks of the past. However, he talks about the Great Kanto Earthquake as if it was someone else's story. So he may have been living far away from the Kanto area. The Shiromiya family may have been living in Odawara, but not all the branch families were. Grandfather often called himself part of a branch of the part of a branch of a branch family. The least connected to the successor. And that means. The beloved hometown might not be Odawara at all. I've never heard anything about grandfather's hometown, and I doubt he'd actually tell me if I asked. If the SoCal beloved hometown isn't referring to the Ushiramiya family roots, then the Odawara theory is wrong from the beginning. 
Of course, it doesn't completely remove the possibility that it was Sogakishi. For example, perhaps he lived in Odawara while he was very young, but moved away who far away later. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about! Maria had been completely left out the conversation, and she now sat puffing out her cheeks in boredom. So, basically, if we can't even agree on a starting point for this dice game of gold, we're totally stuck! But wait, after the first five lines, the thing we end up finding is a key, right? Even if you don't have a key, it's always possible to bust through a door. Can we just skip the first five lines and start figuring out the rest? I hadn't thought of that. Oh well, we're just wasting time anyway. Let's hear the rest of Battler's reasoning. But in the next part, it gets dark really fast. Shannon frowned slightly, after looking back at Maria's notebook to recall what was written there. Yeah, I was forced to agree. When the first twilight offer the six chosen by the key as sacrifices. It sure does get horrible quickly, damn. When the second twilight, it says to tear apart the two who are close. Does that mean to make them break off their loving relationship? Or does it mean to literally tear them apart? I don't know, but either way, it's pretty disgusting. Even if we set that second line aside, it mentions six people for the first twilight, then five people for the four through eight twilights. So at least 11 people must be sacrificed. They're sacrifices to revive Beatrice! I see. Sacrifices to restore the witch. Yeah, that's what it means. Near the end, the witch will be revived in the night twilight. That last part is guaranteed. On the night twilight, the witch shall revive and none shall be left alive. So everyone will die in the end. And after that, the tenth twilight is the goal line. Not sure how you're supposed to reach the golden land if everyone's dead by then. Depending on how you interpret it, the traveler who holds the key, the traveler who holds the key may or may not be included in the none shall be left alive part. But in the end, there's something pretty interesting. After reaching the goal, the witch gives out four treasures. One shall be all the gold. The problem is the next one. It says the dead souls will be resurrected, right? Doesn't that sound like it means everyone who died in the earlier lines? If you put it like that, then the part about reviving lost love might refer to the pair torn apart in the second twilight. That's right. And the fourth one refers to the ninth twilight. The fourth treasure is putting the witch revived on the ninth twilight to sleep. If we put a happy spin on all this, it'll be hectic with people dying and breaking up all over the place, but it'll all be made right in the end. The awakened witch will sleep again, and everything will be like it was at the start, except with a huge pile of gold. The witch must be pretty busy, what with all that killing, reviving, breaking up and reuniting. Not to mention waking up and sleeping. Sheesh. Just when the teller hidden goal was getting interesting, it all gets pretty dubious once the witch starts showing up. Too true. I laughed along with Jessica. After all, the idea of a witch was just too ridiculous. Of course, once we started laughing like that, Maria, who believed in the witch, shot us both dead. I mean, got angry. The witch is incredible! She can do anything with magic! Even kill! Even bring back to life! Even give love, even take it! She can fly in the sky, can become invisible, can make gold and bread out of nothing! Calm down. 
My bad, we were just joking. Jessica apologized, sticking out her tongue, but Maria didn't accept it. She grabbed her notebook back out of my hands and opening to pages, opening to some other pages, tried to prove that the witch existed. Those pages had such colorful drawings of witches on them, and well, conveyed the fantastical image Maria had of witches. Wasn't a normal sinister image of a crooked nose, a crooked nose hag flying around on a broom, but a dreamlike person with unnatural powers who could do anything and wore a beautiful dress. It was just what you'd expect from an imaginative little girl. Flitting through the sky, crossing a rainbow, dancing around all night with a teacup and a teapot that would never get empty no matter how much you poured out of it. With a flourish of her staff, the stars in the sky would become candy to pour down, and flowers that produced sweets would bud by the roadside. To Maria, witches were the only concept that can embody the magical dream that, that so captivated her. As she grew older, it was the last remaining thing that she could give rich that could give richness to her dull and plain everyday life, boring as. That's why Maria believed in witches. She didn't want that dream of hers to be tarnished. That's why she didn't want anyone to tarnish the epitaph, which affirmed the existence of witches. Because the witch named Beatrice is Maria's dream. She gonna be the first to die! To Maria, the epitaph isn't the guide to the hidden gold, but magic to revive the witch. So it was a single link between Maria and the witch. Maria was very angry and clung to George. Jessica and I scratched our heads and apologized. Uh, uh, it might not be possible to smooth things over again like the last time she got mad in front of the portrait. Give me a drink of this water. My throat needs to get wet. I like it when my throat is wet and moist. Maria didn't seem willing to be easily consoled. Unlike Jessica and I hung our heads wondering what to do. Shannon timidly opened her mouth. Um, Maria, did you know? There are ghost stories about Beatrice that have been passed down among the servants. Ah, yeah, that's right! Shana, tell us about it. I don't really know, but it's apparently pretty famous among the servants. What's this? A ghost story? Yes. It seems the story from before we were born. I also heard about it from my mother. Yes, it has been passed down since the time of the mansion's construction. The servants of that time whispered that the mansion had two masters, one of the day and one of the night. The tale that Shana told was just a typical campfire ghost story. If there was, any, if there was a forest with a witch living inside it, then of course the witch would come pay the mansion a visit from time to time. At some point, this ghost story naturally spread up between the servants. When people do the rounds to when people do the rounds a second time to check doors, windows and locks that were supposedly closed, and windows and locks that were supposedly closed, they find some of them left open. Lights that were supposed to be off were turned on, and lights that were supposed to be on went out. The things left lying around would disappear, and things would appear when no one had any memory of putting them there. When any of these things happened, the old servants were said that the witch had visited the mansion, invisible and was playing pranks. See, she exists! Beatrice exists! You dumb fuck! Yeah, she exists. Long ago, it was always right. Before leaving for school, I wasn't able to find my bag and stuff. Maria puffed out her chest with an ooh, ooh, ooh. As though this was final proof of the witch's existence. If I open my mouth like Kendrick, Maria would probably be hurt again, so I didn't. I mean, you hear this kind of story everywhere. Depending on the place, they might blame it on an elf or a dwarf. The only difference is that they call it in a witch on this island. Of course, walking around a vast, elegant mansion at night would be a little unsettling. It's an island devoid of people. Since the mansion is so drafty, Walking around on the night of the thunderstorm would certainly be eerie. In addition, 
Some servants have also seen Will of the Wisps and glittering butterflies dancing around. Kion also saw something like that when he went patrolling one night. And recently, you often hear servants talking about strange footsteps heard out inside the mansion near midnight. We've whispered together that Beatrice in the painting sometimes makes herself invisible and walks through the mansion. It happened a while ago, but even I have heard footsteps while patrolling at night that resemble these stories. That's scary, shit. But there's nothing to be afraid of. Beatrice is another ruler of this mansion, separate from the master. So there's no need to be unnaturally afraid. If you respect her, I hear she won't do anything bad. However, she can be quite terrifying if you don't respect her, right? Correct. I've heard that just before I began working here, someone who spoke badly about Beatrice fell down the stairs and quit after receiving a large injury on their back. Because of that, there was a rumor between the servants that Beatrice's anger had been brought down upon this person. Anger will definitely be brought down on Battler and Jessica. Oh, I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Please! Beatrice, please! I don't want her anger brought down on me! Don't wish that on me! I apologize, Maria, damn! Of course! I also apologize to the witch! I'm sorry, Beatrice! Please, forgive an outsider's nonsense! I'll apologize as well! I'm sorry, Beatrice! Will the witch be able to forgive us now? Hell no. Nah. Like, I don't know. Witches are fickle. So they forgive when they want to and don't when they don't. That's no good. Maria, isn't there some kind of good luck charm that could prevent Battler and Jessica from suffering Beatrice's wrath? Maybe something that can block against magic? By relying on Maria, who was proud of knowing the most about witches, George was trying to revive her self-esteem. Once again, I've got to admire his ability to calm kids down. After taking a moment to cross her arms and seriously ponder whether there might be a charm that could save us, he started flipping through the pages in her notebook. I thought it was just a scribbled diary, but there also seemed to be quite a few pages that looked like they'd come from a book on black magic. Maria solemnly considered a group of these pages which contained things that looked like magic circles. Apparently, Grandfather wasn't the only one with the black magic hobby. When Maria finally found what she was looking for, she snapped the book shut and threw it into her handbag. They began fishing to the bag's contents. There seemed to be various jumbled up things in there. After a while, she took out various pieces of junk, although they were probably important magical items to Maria, and repeatedly threw them back in saying they were wrong. It was all a little humorous. Just like when Doraemon took out the wrong tool. Finally, she seemed to discover what she was looking for. But the face that was unimaginably cheery when compared to the intense expression she'd worn until now, she held those out to Jessica and me. I grabbed it, and I saw a little, it was a very cheap looking charm. It looked like a bracelet made from a plastic rosary with a scorpion themed metal attached. Haven't you ever seen those cheap Zodiac themed accessories? The kind you might win in a crane game at an arcade? It really looked like something like that. There were two of them. Probably one for me and one for Jessica. However, the fact that the two of them made that, that there were two of them made them feel even more like cheap manufactured goods, making it pretty hard to think of them as magical items. You're giving these to me and Battler? With these charms, you don't even need to worry about Beatrice. Because scorpions have the power to ward off magic. Huh, really? They didn't know scorpions could do that. Shut up, nigga. Battler doesn't believe. I said too much and angered Maria again. Maria, Maria took out a notebook again, pointing out various pages as she went on and on about how... The scorpion had such an incredible holy power that it had been used in magic-repelling magic circles since ancient time. 
Ah, uh, I've heard about that from the um, some fuck no. I've heard about that from some of the other young servants. I think about how the scorpion is drawn as a magic repelling symbol in sorcery. Oh, really? The scorpion protects against bad magic and calamity. And emeralds bring peace to the heart. Therefore, its effects are twofold. It's true. The scorpion wraps around the emerald and protects it. Yes, that certainly does sound like it worked well. I really wanted to make fun of these dumbass charms. But as I watched Maria explaining it with all her heart and realized that she found them for our sakes, I think I just let it slide. I started to feel like it might actually work, even if it was just a prize from some game center. The material quality of the charm didn't matter. What mattered was the strength of her feelings. Dumbass. Fucking corny ass nigga. Even I don't think of myself as the sort of loser who'd laugh at something like that. Okay, thank you. I apologize to Beatrice, but even if I do end up getting cursed, I'll be safe now thanks to Maya's charm. Right, Jessica? Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Maria. Wear it on your arm when you want your heart to be at peace. Put it in your wallet and your money won't decrease. If you're hanging from a doorknob but things can't get in, it's a really convenient charm. What an incredible effect. If Maria gives it her confident seal of approval, then it surely must be reliable. Shannon clapped her hands together and Maria stuck out her chest. She was totally in a good mood again. It's probably best we let her lead the conversation a bit longer if it'll keep her in such a good mood. Come to think of it, she looked a bit bored when we were getting excited about the hidden gold, probably because she couldn't keep up. She is not Twister. No, that was big, that was Busta Rhymes. Can you keep up? While eating the cookies Kumasawa had baked, Jessica and I asked Maria this and that about black magic. Maria happily chatted away in response to our questions. Each time, George and Shana would act surprised to chime in. The clouds in the sky grew darker and darker, but we cousins really enjoyed communicating freely after a year of separation. Did I just feel a drop on my forehead? Uh, I wonder. As George rubbed his forehead, he looked up at the sky. Considering the color of the sky and the dampness of the air, it wouldn't have been odd for a raindrop to hit him. The wind also seems to have grown a bit stronger. I didn't feel a drop. Only I didn't. Fucking mad for. Don't worry, neither did I. Anyway, I'm sure it'll rain so much tonight that everyone will feel plenty of drops. That's right. Maybe we should head back soon. Shana looked down at her watch. It was probably well into the evening by now. Is it already time for you to return your work? Yes. Thank you very much for allowing me to enjoy some time together with you all. Tell Kumasawa thanks for the cookies. Okay, everyone, help out with the cleanup. Shannon declined our help, saying that this was a servant's job. But picking up a drop fork before the waitress has to, before the waitress has to, is like my purpose in life. We folded up the blankets, gathered up the trash, and helped clean everything up. The trash is getting away! I won't let it escape. I'll grab it before Maria does. I'll grab it. Don't get your shoes wet. You'll get in trouble. To Maria, chasing after some trash sent flying by the powerful winds was just another game. By the time we finished, the wind was blowing pretty strong. Probably a good time to head back. Damn. You've all helped me out a lot. Thank you very much. Looks like you're really out of time. It's okay if you head back first. George perceived from her hurried appearance that very little of her free time was left. 
Genji is very strict about time. If you don't show up when you're supposed to be at the right time, I bet he'll be pissed. We'll see you later. Do your best with your work. Yes. Then, if you will excuse me. What a sweetheart. After making a respectful bow, Shannon ran toward the Rose Garden. Alright, let's head back to the guest house. We could watch TV or something and relax a little. Wanna watch TV? Wanna watch TV? Then it's decided. Let's all head back and watch TV together. Mario, who wasn't done having fun, agreed once television was mentioned. We climbed up the gentle stairs and returned to the Rose Garden. Oh, hell no. I don't fuck with this. The wind had grown very strong, and roses shook throughout the garden like ripples on the water. This might be our last chance to see the beautiful roses. I'll bet tonight's typhoon ruins them. Damn, these roses might be done in by tonight's winds. You're right. Still, I think the roses were pretty lucky. After all, they got to welcome all of you before the, ty before the typhoon. All flowers lose their petals eventually. But that means we can admire them even more when they're in bloom. That's right. Mari, burn this image into your eyes. At this moment, they're the best roses of the year. Burned into my eyes. Right then, Maria suddenly clapped her hands. It looked like she'd remembered something. My rose. The typhoon will send it flying. Oh, you mean that sad looking rose George marked with the ribbon? Maria apparently remembered where the rose was. She ran at full speed. The rest of us followed her. Where was that again? I'm sure it was somewhere around here. We searched everywhere around that area, but it was only a single flower among all these roses after all. Even though we knew it was somewhere close by, we weren't able to find it. The wind's making the typhoon's front line. The wind. Fuck! The wind's making up the typhoon's front lines made the roses throughout the garden undul uh, undulate. Almost like it was teasing us by making the location of Maria's Rose impossible to find. Maybe it wasn't here. Let's try spreading out a bit in our search. Is it that serious? Sounds good. Let's go for strength in numbers. Huh? What's up, Maria? As we made the split up and search, Maria tugged on my jacket with an unhappy face. You could tell she didn't want us to leave that spot. What is it? What's wrong? My rose is here! It's here! But it's actually not, right? Maybe it was on the other side of the flower bed. If we all look, we'll find it fast, okay? It's here, nigga! My rose is fucking here! Look for it! Look for it! This bitch tweaking. This bitch tweaking. Maria stomped her feet in irritation. She pointed at that spot and said it was definitely there. But in actuality, that shit was not there. Even so, Maria got mad when we said we were going to search elsewhere. We were at a loss for what to do. For a while, we had to stay near Mario and pretend to search through that rose thicket. Not here. Not here. Not here. What the fuck is up with her? Maybe she's saying that it should be here, but isn't? Mario became increasingly irritated. Oh, man. Maria is really losing her temper. 
Sometimes, Maria starts to really care about pointless stuff. If she gets what she wants, that's okay, but... You can't find something that isn't there. It's not good. Just when we were at a loss for what to do, Mario called down in a loud voice. We could see Aunt Rosa in the direction Mar Mario was waving her hand. Maybe she wanted to look at the garden one more time before the typhoon came. Or maybe she had some business at the guest house. Aunt Rosa was coming from the mansion. She quickly noticed her daughter's voice and came over. My, my, what happened, everyone? Are you looking for something? Look for it! Oh, my, my fault. Mama, you look for my rose, too! Your rose? We found an unhealthy rose around here and marked it. We tied a candy wrapper around it. But Maria, if I remember correctly, it was growing right in front and really stood out, didn't it? Unless it grew legs and ran off somewhere, it must have been somewhere else. Maybe you remembered it wrong? It is here! It is here! Battler doesn't believe! Bitch ass nigga! It's here! How many times do I have to tell you to stop saying uh, uh, before you'll understand? Mama will look for it, so shut the fuck up. I've never seen Aunt Rosa be anything other than kind and gentle, so her anger surprised me a bit. Aunt Rosa began searching as well, so he went along with her for the time being. But we were already more than sure that it wasn't around here. So it didn't take long for Aunt Rosa to realize that too. The rose isn't here. Did you mistake this place for somewhere else? There are so many roses around. That's wrong! It is here! Mama doesn't believe! If you do not control your damn child, I already believed you and looked hard for it, didn't I? But it isn't here. But it is here! It is here, but it isn't! Then someone must have ripped it out. Anyway, stop saying, uh, uh, it's fucking stupid. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Who ripped out my rose? Who did? It's that fucking, it's that fucking witch. You, hey, that's, it's that fucking witch. Give it back, give it back! How should I know? Stop it! Stop saying oh! Aunt Rosa slapped Mario's left cheek with her palm. In that instant, Mario was shocked into silence. Of course, it was only for an instant. I can't fucking blame her! She was possessed of some shit. Like, oh my goodness. See now, look. Props to Rosa. Because my dad would have slapped the shit out of me way earlier than that. The second he said, stop saying, uh, and I said, uh, he would have said, I said, shut your ass up. Like, Aunt Rosa got the patience of a damn doctor. <laughs> she got more patience than a waiting room, my nigga. Because she waited long as hell to slap the fuck out of her. When Mario realized her wish was being rejected, she started yelling even louder. And this is when you pull out the belt. My rose! My rose! It cannot be this serious! Didn't I tell you to stop that weird habit? That's why all the kids in class make fun of you. Damn, okay, we're bullying now? We're bullying children? Hold on, Rosa, calm down. It can't be this serious, Rosa. Rosa, look, it can't... Why is she more mad about the ooh, ooh than she is about, like, her tweaking the fuck out? Like, Rosa, your priorities are a little skewed. Cut it out! Damn, again? Hold on! Once again, her palm slapped Maria's cheek. This time, she didn't go silent. She, she choked as she started crying. 
and began to bawl in an increasingly loud voice. Aunt Rosa was clearly irritated and lifted her hand once, mo once more to try to shut her daughter up. Uh, 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 auntie, 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 come on, come on. Hey, look, look. We're all friends here, all right? Come on. What does FNAF stand for? <laughs> what does FNAF? Come on, now, now, she's just a little kid, so there's no reason to get so serious. <laughs> I, I tried to cut in with a bitter smile, rubbing my hands together. But Aunt Rosa glared at me with a serious face, and I realized she was about to beat my ass. I should have stayed out of this. <sighs> I'm sorry, but could the rest of you go back to your room for a bit? I need to have a little talk with Maria. She don't fucking listen. Nobody believes in my rose! Even though it was here! Look for it! I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Look, I'm not upset about the ooh ooh shit. I think it's funny. I fuck with that. But, all this other shit? Calm the fuck, Rosa, just pull out the damn belt. Like, on everything, just pull the fucking belt out, bro, at this point. Like, I don't, you should never, you should never hit your child in the face. That should never be the first thing you do. Like, maybe, 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 maybe like to check them right quick, like a, like shut your ass up like that. But you don't do it twice. You don't do it twice. You don't do it twice. After the first time, you just pull out the belt and you do what you need to do. But you don't hit the child in the face twice. That's fucked up. Ah, uh, you don't do it twice. That's fucked up. It's already kind of fucked up to do it once. But it's fucked up to do it twice. All right? Shut the fuck up. Damn. Here, it was here. But it's not here. You must have confused this place for somewhere else, right? It is here. It's definitely here! Beatrice is mad at Mario for thinking two dumbass charms could stop her curse. So, so Beatrice is like, I'm gonna make this bitch panic. <laughs> then it disappeared! Give it up! Why? Why did it disappear? Why? Why? I don't fucking know! Damn! Stop saying, ooh! ooh. Aunt Rosa once again raised her hand, overcome by emotion, and slapped Maria's cheek. Aunt Rosa, do you need anger management classes? You're a sweetheart, okay? But it'd be the sweethearts that tweak out the hardest, you feel me? So you might need to get that checked out. Hit a therapist, you know, tell them that you try to be nice, but you get overcome by anger and shit. You know, just, just check into that shit. You know, I ain't, so I ain't talking about no institution. Like, they don't gotta look into your brain or fuck you up or nothing, but just hit up a therapist and, like, get some get some anger management, all right? Because there's no reason for you to slap your child in the face three times because they saying dumb shit, all right? It was strong enough to knock Mari, and then she, you knocked the bitch over. I'm sorry, Mari, you're not a bitch. You knocked a little hoe over. <laughs> hey, uh, Aunt Rosa, even if she's your daughter, violence isn't the answer. Right? I stepped between them to protect Maria, who was still on the ground crying, ooh, ooh. I knew that as an outsider, problems between parent and child were none of my business. But I wasn't brought up to suddenly observe something like this. <sighs> Don't you think it's weird, battler? Are there any girls at your school who mutter, ooh, ooh? Well, I am in high school. But for an elementary schooler, I think saying, ooh, ooh is pretty cute. Cute. Saying ooh, ooh is cute. Cute! My careless words seem to have earned me on Rosa's wrath. She grabbed my collar with a terrifying expression. Don't say such dumb shit! Do you know how old Maria is? She's nine! She's a fourth grader! Not a kindergartner! That's a fair fucking point. I'ma be real. My little brother, when he was in fourth grade, look, we wasn't beating his ass over dumb shit like this. But we was like, you know, we was yelling at him and telling him like, stop that shit, you too old. We was doing, we wasn't beating his ass. That's too much. No reason to beat his ass. He's gonna grow out of it himself eventually. 
But we was letting them know, like, yo, that shit corny as fuck. Stop. Right? We wasn't beating his ass, though. Damn. But she still makes that sound during class. Don't you get it? Do you know what they say about this kid when they bully her? Thanks to this weird habit, she still hasn't made a single friend. Damn, Unrosen, you got a fuck ton of trauma behind those eyes, don't you? You got you got shit in your closet. You got shit in your closet that ain't come to light. You you got trauma. Yo, your daddy must have beat the shit. Well, they did say her daddy used to beat the shit out of them, huh? Your daddy must have fucking hated you on everything. You got trauma on everything. You Kendrick Lamar, you got daddy issues, father time type shit. Use father time to rewind and go back to them times when you were seeing your father acting not so sublime and beating your ass over a single fucking dime type shit. Don't turn your eyes from reality and carelessly call Maria cute. Think more seriously about this kid's future. I told you stop making that sound! Didn't I tell you to stop it? Unrosa struck Maria's quivering head, hitting her in the head? From which an increasingly unhappy voice was rising. I tried to stop it, but Aunt Rosa pushed me away. My back hit George. Y'all just let... Y'all just let this shit go down now? A long time ago, Aunt Rosa also thought of it as nothing more than one of Maria's baby words. But now that it hasn't been fixed even midway through elementary school, she's been worrying about it a lot. How she talks isn't really that big a deal, right? She'll never make it as an adult if she's like that. So even though it isn't fun to watch, this is probably, this is a problem between parent and child. Well, even I get chewed out by mom all the time because of how I talk. When they put it that way, maybe even a scene as painful as this isn't something an outsider like me should butt in on. Battler, when you were a kid, did you have any bad habits that you couldn't fix and that got you in trouble? Well, one or two. On parents day once, I kept getting yelled at in front of everyone. And it was embarrassing as hell. It was embarrassing as all hell. Well, then you can understand how the two of them must feel right now. I'm sure they don't want us to be here around. I'm about to say, like, nigga, leave. Do not pay. Like, bro, I don't. I wouldn't even want to see this shit. I'm not gonna lie. I wouldn't even want to see this shit. I hate seeing kids get whooped, bro. I hate that so much. Like, I hate seeing kids get whooped. Like, that shit made me feel so fucking bad. You understand too, don't you, Jessica? I didn't think. I don't think anyone likes to be seen when they're being scolded. Let's go. We'll return to the guest house. Then after Maria comes back, let's welcome her as if nothing happened. That's probably for the best, isn't it? Damn. We thought George's point was probably a reasonable one. We may have been eager to use that reasonable sounding argument as justification to retreat from this heart-rending scene. Jessica and I nodded at George and we all left. We called towards Maria, telling her that we were going to head to the guest house, but she didn't seem to hear, and we felt sort of guilty and shameless after saying it. In that case, look by yourself as much as you want. Mama doesn't care. Have it your way. After blasting her with those last few words, Rosa spun on her heels and quickly returned to the mansion. Mario probably viewed that as a cold gesture meant to injure, but that just wasn't that. That wasn't Rosa's intention. It was because the hand 
with which had so emotionally struck Maria's cheek was still numb. It was because if she stayed there screaming, she might again be taken over by her emotions and continue slapping her daughter. After Rosa left, Maria was left alone in the rose garden. The wind began to blow stronger and stronger, and every once in a while a raindrop would fall on her forehead. However, Maria couldn't leave that place, not until she found that poor wilting rose. That definitely been there, even so, it wasn't. Even though she knew the place and even though she knew the place and even though it had been there, it wasn't. Maria bitterly stared at the place it was supposed to be and thought frantically. Maybe the angle I'm looking from is wrong. Maybe the height I'm looking from is wrong. While gazing at a single point, Maria repeatedly stood up, changed her position and continued to stare. The wind was getting stronger and stronger, but Maria kept looking for that rose in front of the flower bed. Well, shit. Kenzo noticed a sign of raindrops beating on the window. It seemed to be pouring down thickly. It had begun to rain later than the weather report I predicted. Kenzo approached the window as if being summoned by the sound of the rain. The sound of rain is the sound of silence. The sound feels quieter than any silence. It makes humans remember that, in the end, they are alone from the moment they're born to the moment they die. You're late, Beatrice. Were those words directed at the rainy sky? There was no one to be seen in the direction of Kenzo's gaze. Well then, let us begin. Let us begin our banquet of miracles. This island has now been cut off from the world. Now there are none who can interrupt my ceremony. There are so many fitting sacrifices for you. Four of my children, three of their companions, four of my grandchildren, me and my guests and my servants. You may devour as many as you please. The key of fate will select the sacrifices in accordance with the demon's roulette. If that roulette chooses me, even I will become your sacrifice. However, because of that, because I will bet on such madness, I will most assuredly bring forth a grand miracle. Come, devour to your heart's content. I will achieve victory over that roulette. Yes, I'll put everything on the line. First, I'll return the inheritance of the Ushira Mia family. Accept it! Kenzo tore the window open, ripped the golden ring off his finger, and forcefully threw it away. At that time, the sound of thunder rang out, giving the illusion that the lightning had accepted the ring. And when you are resurrected, surely I will be the one who stands witness! I will survive until the end and watch over you as you awaken. So come, Beatrice. Welcome to my banquet. In exchange for all that I have created, show me another miracle just this once. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoy, like, subscribe, leave a comment. I'll read them all, tap into the next one. Man, this nigga Kenzo fucking psycho. Oh my goodness, bro. Uh, shit. This definitely took a damn turn. I was not expecting this to end how it fucking ended. Everything was so happy and jolly and good. And then this nigga fucking Maria starts tweaking out and shit and then she gets cool again then she starts tweaking out again and then Rosa beats the fuck out of her and then leaves and 
and then Kenzo starts being a psychopath. Like, oh my fucking fuck am I playing? Damn. Uh. But peace out. I love y'all. Hope y'all enjoy. Have